Do you think these images are beautiful? Do you know why? Most people never stop to think about why they find something beautiful. It's something you just know. Maybe we find beauty in the same places, but even if we disagree, do we process beauty in the same way? These things are pretty subjective, but scientists have been working to see if there's a universal way that humans process beauty. Beauty may be in the eye of the beholder, but researchers have discovered that our brains all behave similarly when beholding. A new branch of neuroscience called neuroaesthetics describes scientists' attempts to understand our perception and response to beauty and further understand how beauty evokes feelings of pleasure. Researchers have discovered patterns in certain parts of the brain that become more active when people see the things that they find visually pleasant. I would like to address, in terms of brain activity, a single question of huge interest which is, on the one hand, extremely simple, and on the other hand, extremely complex. Namely, what is beauty? Notable professor of neuroaesthetics, Seymour Ziki, is known for his work on art appreciation. He's widely known in his field for research on the human brain and how it processes beauty in art and music. You find that in addition to the visual areas and other areas which I'll not talk about, there is this area here in the medial orbital frontal cortex, a part of the emotional brain, a part of the reward centers of the brain. Is there a characteristic or a single set of characteristics that defines beauty? The answer is yes, but the answer comes from a very surprising source. It comes from the brain, not from the works of art. The part of the brain that Zeke references that interprets beauty, the medial orbital frontal cortex, is the same area that neuroscientists describe as the reward and pleasure center of the brain. When you experience beauty, blood flow increases to that area, causing a release of dopamine. That's right, the good stuff. It's important to note that in Zeke's experiment, they made sure that no participant was an artist or musician because they wanted to avoid any knowledge of those fields, creating a bias. But this opens up another interesting question. Can certain types of beauty only be appreciated if you have a certain level of education or expertise? For example, an art historian may find a certain work of art beautiful because of what their studies bring to the piece. Maybe they know what the artist went through to create the painting, giving it a totally different and perhaps more beautiful context. On the other hand, an untrained eye might just see a nice looking painting and then move on, missing the story behind the artwork. But let's consider beauty in a vacuum. You don't have to be an art expert to know that you might prefer certain shapes, patterns, or colors over others. Are there consistent things across the human experience that everyone finds beautiful? A 2007 study published in the Journal of Physiological Anthropology from Chiba University examined the physiological effects of colors on brain activity and blood pressure, as well as the feelings those colors evoked. The subjects were shown red, blue, and green cards and lights in random order. The end result concluded that red drove the subjects into a state of anxiety, while blue had a more calming effect. This suggests that certain colors have consistent effects on people, which could support the notion that there are things that can be universally beautiful. But according to a 1999 article published by the Journal of International Marketing, the answer is not so cut and dry when it comes to colors because they can have totally different meanings across cultures. For example, red may be anxiety inducing in some cultures, but in China, red is often equated with happiness. Someone in Hong Kong is more likely to send red and black wedding invitations and red roses while a customer in Japan is more likely to send white. The Japanese also consider purple to be a sign of wealth, while Americans associate the color with things that are inexpensive, and they feel similarly about the color orange. But orange in Hindu households is revered as a holy color. And as if things weren't already complicated enough, some cultures, like the Dembo in Zambia, don't even differentiate orange as a unique color to begin with. Okay, so while color may be entwined with personal experience, what about the composition of a piece of art? Artists use space, texture, and perspective to evoke a variety of feelings and responses. Let's go a little bit more commercial with this one and look at how companies and brands approach this challenge. The idea of universal beauty is a particularly tricky problem for global brands because they don't want to unintentionally ostracize a community and lose customers. It's important that the branding be inclusive. This has led brand and logo designers to experiment in capitalizing on universally recognized forms of beauty. One trick that designers love is called the golden ratio. We've got a more detailed video on the subject in the links below, but the basic idea is this. The golden ratio occurs when the ratio of two quantities is the same as the ratio of their sum to the larger of the two quantities. What? Uh, I don't know. It's hard to describe, but it's easy to find. It follows the symmetry of the Greek letter phi and can be found not just in logos and brand development, but also, amazingly, in nature. We also find this ratio in classic art, from da Vinci to Dali and even Seurat. The symmetry of the ratio serves to create an aesthetically pleasing and natural looking pattern in art, logos, images, and even products like phones, computers, and cars. 
This fixation on beauty and symmetry isn't just for Renaissance painters and corporate marketers. Most influencers and internet personalities will tell you that in today's world, your social media's aesthetics say a lot about you and your hashtag brand. Successful Instagrammers and YouTubers and the MySpacers and Tumblrers before them know that a uniform and cohesive stream of content that works well together is the most aesthetically pleasing. So does that mean that beauty is being defined more and more by how many people find something beautiful? The end result of that kind of thinking might lead some people to cultivate an image of themselves that others find visually beautiful but may end up far away from the reality of who they are. Yikes. On the flip side, social media platforms can allow us to form communities around a shared notion of beauty. If you're someone who finds beauty outdoors, there's no shortage of Instagram users dedicated to hashtag nature. Whether it's accounts devoted to tattoo artists or Pinterest boards that inspire the perfect wedding, the internet and social media can offer a hub to discover and cultivate your awareness of your own sense of beauty. So maybe your brain processes beauty in the same way as everybody else's. While there are some hacks that might get you closer to a shared experience, ultimately you define your perception of beauty. So what do you find beautiful that others don't? Tell us about it in the comments. And if you're interested in learning more about how we perceive beauty, you may want to check out some classes on Skillshare, like this class led by graphic designer Ellen Lupton. In her class, Demystifying Beauty, she examines how interpretation of beauty in art can spur the creative process. And if you enjoyed the video, don't forget to like, share, subscribe, and hit the bell if you want to know when we post more. Thanks for watching.